So, here we are with our second episode of Space Patrol Orion, Planet Out of Orbit. Remember that title. We kick off, not with the Orion, but with the Hydra, General Van Dyke's ship. Achtung! Im Gebiet der Jagdhunde wurde ein Planet aus seiner Bahn geworfen. Es handelt sich eindeutig um eine Supernova. Dieser Schnellläufer rast auf die Erde zu. Considering we're dealing with a translation of a 60s era TV show, I think we want to reinterpret what they're trying to say. Remember, it's called Planet Out of Orbit. So I think what they're saying is that a supernova has caused a now burning planet to be thrown out of orbit towards the Earth. Of course, even allowing for that, it still misses out on the space's big problem that many people seem to have trouble wrapping their heads around. Some know just enough to sound stupid, like seeing our galaxy is millions of light years across, or confusing the solar system with the galaxy with the universe, and of thinking that Parsec is a unit of time, but the most common mistake is forgetting that anything not using some kind of invented faster than light concept means that anything outside the solar system is years away from threatening us. So this planet shouldn't be a problem. But of course it is, so Earth is at risk of total destruction. McLean always takes things in stride, doesn't he? Uncle Cliff, darf ich unser Raumschiff holen? I told you, no killing Batman until after you've picked up your room. Galactic Security interrupts his downtime and confiscates his phone so that he can't contact his crew. Things have gotten serious. The Hydra has discovered the situation is no coincidence. The frogs are somehow behind it and they don't take kindly to the Hydra watching. McLean is horrified when he hears something might have happened. He clearly has a lot of respect for his commanding officer. After all, he's served under her for six years. She's an extremely competent officer, and she's pretty hot in a women-behind-bars exploitation flick kind of way. So naturally, McLean wants to rush out there and try to save her, and her crew too, I guess. It's going to be men's right. Herr Oberst, Plan de X-17. Rette die Erde. Should go much better than Plan 9, ja? The leadership assembles and demands to know why McLean didn't report this supernova, to which the answer is, I don't know the future. Everyone backs it up that this happened after Orion had returned from his patrol, so that finally the boss is left standing there with an expression that says, Well... Why didn't you tell me before? Now it looks like I'm the asshole. So they turn the subject to the more important matter of what the hell do we do about this out-of-control planet that will wipe out our civilization. Möglichkeiten außerhalb der Erde haben, gleichgültig wie die Entscheidung der Regierung ausfällt. Die Regierung. Regierung erwartet unsere Vorschläge. Haben Sie ja gehört? Mein Vorschlag lautet Evakuierung der Erdbevölkerung. Aber wie soll ich eine Evakuierung veranlassen, wenn mir nicht sämtliche Raumschiffe zur Verfügung stehen? Herr Gott, begreifen Sie denn? General J. Jonah Jameson does make a valid point. After all, Uber can only handle so much. The others counter, yeah, you don't have enough ships, so there's no point in even trying an evacuation. I mean, I know that might sound defeatist, but they're estimating figures, and it's hard to tell based on the subtitles, Either it's one out of every four million people they could save, or else it's just a flat quarter of a million people they can save. Basically, that's about the size of North Las Vegas. Uh, that's a separate city from regular Las Vegas. It's, it's where the women prison is. Which only makes me think of poor General Van Dyke again. But either way, it's a tiny number requiring all of their ships, rather than using those ships to maybe save the entire planet if they were put to the same purpose. No. So, so. So, 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 so. Dann können Sie mir auch sagen, was zum Teufel der oberste Rat ab morgen auf den Marsmonden Deimos und Phobos zu suchen hat, wenn er hier die Erdbevölkerung ihrem Schicksal überlässt? Politiker finden immer was zu regieren, auch wenn schon längst nichts mehr da ist. Da Must not have been a very telling argument if even the subtitles don't care. As they continue to try to hash it out, some expert speaks up to say that they have seven days until impact and that even before that, the planet is going to be all effed up by the heat of it anyway. The impact will just be the final splat. You know, like 
shooting someone and then pissing on the corpse. So, five days, but if we can deal with the frogs that are responsible for this, then it should miss Earth without killing everyone, which would be good, although probably still pants filling. General Mustache doesn't think it's possible, but McLean does, with the scientist's plan. Destroy the frog station by, and it sounds like they're saying destroying the star. That's either not accurate or a bit overkill. So, McLean and his crew have a mission, but the bad news is that the Hydra has been written off as lost. And admittedly, they're in a rough position. When we catch up with them, the ship's falling to pieces, they have three days' worth of oxygen left, and... Well, okay, that's it, but really, isn't that enough? What do we have to add on there? And there's a mutant on board? Their straits are dire enough already. The Orion is on the case, and while there's some uncertainty as to whether or not they can even do anything... They at least get a line on where the signal is coming from. Except, without a second point of reference to triangulate, knowing where the frogs are is a lot harder than saying make it so. No, this is a situation that calls for... can-do attitude. One bit of good news, they get in touch with the Hydra, but the rescue plan is refused before they can even start on it. General, I hold you. No! Selbstverständlich, hold you! I forbid you to come to the Hydra. Look at her, she's almost lifelike. Those special effects are incredible. I think the frogs might have replaced their political officer with a ventriloquist dummy. But yeah, Van Dyke is all about saving the Earth, even if it means her and her crew die. But there's more than a chance to just say goodbye here. With their data, they can now triangulate where the control station is and do what they do best. Kill frogs. So the general gives them the coordinates, but the communication breaks down. And when McLean reacts, Yegolovsk pulls her gun, or possibly her French horn. Wenn Sie Kuss auf die Hydra nehmen, schmelze ich den Leitstand zusammen. Wollen Sie mich daran hindern, die Besatzung der Hydra zu retten? Commander, ich warne Sie. Ich habe nicht die geringsten Skrupel zu tun, was ich sage. Haben Sie den Verstand verloren? Nein, ich nicht. Sie wissen genau, was passiert, wenn Sie den Leitstand zusammenschmelzen. Es ist Selbstmord, ich weiß. Gehen Sie nicht zu weit. Aber es macht mir nichts aus. Ob ich sterben muss, weil der Leitstand ausfällt. Oder weil der Schnellläufer die Erde zerstört. Oder weil wir durch die Galaxis kreisen, ohne zu wissen, wohin bis uns der Sauerstoff ausgeht. Es ist immer das gleiche Ergebnis und es macht mir nichts aus. Nehmen Sie sich in Acht, Leutnant. Ich habe genauso wenig Skrupel wie Sie. Commander, dass Sie ein Querkopf sind, ist bekannt. Aber ich wusste nicht, dass Sie einfältig, gewissenlos und völlig ohne jedes Verantwortungsgefühl sind. She has a point. He is letting his personal feelings override his judgment. But that's one thing we're seeing about McLean. He cannot give up on people. He can't just look at the cold mathematics and that's enough for him. But she finally persuades him that the only thing they can do right now is destroy the station. Anything else jeopardizes the entire world. So they fly in and blow up the baddies, except there's a problem. Not with the blowing them up, that works out just fine. But that doesn't stop the flaming ball from heading towards the Earth. So we're still going to need to come up with a plan for that. Passt auf. Hier ist der Schnellläufer auf seiner Sturzbahn zur Erde. Hier stehen wir ungefähr. No, no, they're using the zone defense. You're going to have to punt. There's my American entitlement for you right there. I look at this crowning example of German science fiction television and immediately throw in a reference to a sport no other country on Earth gives a shit about. So McLean cooks up a plan to fly in, set off a bunch of antimatter bombs, and then fly off, which is a great plan. I mean, I'd have made that plan A, actually, but I just like the sound of antimatter bombs. Meanwhile, the leadership is having a conniption over the situation, and the government is weighing the pros and cons of evacuation. Pro, everyone survives. Con, this plan is not feasible. Naturally, this debate will likely last several months and cost billions of dollars. Well, the boss believes in McLean, but Mustache finds that childish, so... Just good. Then will I say something weniger kindliches sagen. You have cooties. Eine Frage liegt mir nämlich schon die ganze Zeit auf der Zunge. 
Wie zum Teufel ist es überhaupt möglich, dass diese Bestien da draußen in aller Seelenruhe eine Leitstelle einrichten konnten, von der aus sie eine Nova erzeugen und lenken? Dies alles hat sich noch mehr oder weniger vor unserer Haustür abgespielt. Und das muss von langer Hand vorbereitet gewesen sein. Ich nehme an, Sie richten diese Frage an mich. Ich richte sie an uns alle. The frogs are certainly proving to be a powerful adversary, but while they're left to bicker, the Orion is near the flaming bomb and ready to try. So they fly in and fire off their bombs. Good. But there's a lot of turbulence and the instruments are so hot that Hasso is burning his hands badly just trying to use his controls, and Mario gets injured at the crucial moment so his bombs miss the target. Pity. You think if anyone would know about fireballs, it's Mario. Well, the leadership is really starting to lose it, and they're talking about going rogue at this point. Forget about what the government says. Take action right now to do something. Except the problem is the something they have is evacuation, which they keep reminding themselves of won't work. You can't demand to take action that can't actually do anything. It can't be the answer no matter how much you want it to be if the math doesn't work out. No matter how much you wish it, 10 times 10 is not blowjobs. If they attempt any kind of evacuation, they know that there's going to be panic. And we don't want panic. We want people to just look up at the sky and say, oh shit, and then, you know, keel over dead with real respect and dignity. Well, it looks like the plan's ruined anyway, because someone in the government has had a breakdown over the pending apocalypse, and now people are starting to ask questions. Well, not to worry, there is one last-ditch plan. McLean thinks that they could stop it by smashing Orion itself into the flaming ball. A noble act of self-sacrifice. Ja, für die Erde. Aber ich habe keine Lust abzukratzen. Ihr vielleicht. That they could find some other dumbass to do, I guess. McLean plans to take the shuttles to the Hydra. They might have a chance to survive then, while the Orion itself does all the dirty work. Ob die auf der Hydra noch leben? Das wird sich zeigen. So he has no choice but to issue the order. Hail Hydra. There's no answer, so there's nothing left but to escape while Orion makes its final run to save the world, which it does, blowing up the flaming ball completely. There's delight back on Earth, though when the leadership hears about it, especially Mustache, who is practically dancing, yeah, I'm sure the last thing he wanted was to die in a bunker, but McLean's boss is morose, clearly thinking about him and his crew having died in that explosion, and he refuses to be comforted by anyone else. But not to worry, they're alive and in sight of the Hydra. Ich gehe so dicht an die Hydra ran, dass Hasso umsteigen kann. Ihr haltet sicher als Abstand, bis ihr neue Befehle bekommt, klar? Wieso muss Hasso umsteigen? Funktioniert die Landeautomatik auf der Hydra nicht? Manchmal stellst du Fragen, die sich nicht mal Leutnant Jagielowski einfallen lässt. <laughs> That showed him. Hasso is going to head over in the hopes of restoring the autopilot so that they can dock. But if he can't, well, that means the ship is so screwed up, there's no point in docking anyway. But luckily, Hasso pulls it off and the shuttles dock, but all of a sudden, Hasso stops answering hails. And McLean doesn't even waste time putting on a suit, because sure enough, Hasso's passed out. Drunk on the job, that's our Hasso. McLean takes care of it before he too passes out, and eventually, they both come around to even better news. The crew of the Hydra are still alive in stasis, although they wouldn't have been for much longer if the Orion crew hadn't shown up. So it was lucky they arrived when they did. That is always the considerate thing to do. Notably, McLean, in his desperation to know if she's all right, refers to General Van Dyke as Lydia, hinting perhaps at some kind of history there. I have to wonder, did he ever play the hapless prison guard with her? But yeah, that's all sorted out, and with the help of the shuttles, they're able to limp the Hydra back to base, where many drinks await them, including genuine whiskey made out of actual grain instead of the usual stuff, chemical runoff and lighter fluid. The tricky thing is for McLean to officially explain why he has crashed yet another of their ships. The Orion 7 was a bit like the Enterprise-E, except Picard's crew knew not to keep breaking the damn thing. But this whole thing is secrecy, so rather than proclaiming him and his crew heroes that sacrificed their ship in the salvation of the planet, they make up a story that McLean flew too close to a magnetic storm and destroyed it like a dumbass. 
A move that McLean gets behind, probably because his whiskey glass has enough booze in there to get an entire soccer team drunk. After that, they can say he tried landing it upside down for all he cares. A horrifying atmosphere was one of the real strengths of the first episode. This time it's an atmosphere of peril. The scenes on the Orion have a strong sense of just how high all of the stakes are here. The nerves fraying, and yet the execution of their duties professionally and with the importance that is demanded. The show also walks a careful tightrope, still feeling like they're a team rather than a clique in space, like can often happen, but also there's a familiarity to their professional relationship that allows them to be both human and professionals at the same time. McLean may be unable to divorce his feelings from what he needs to do, but his interaction with the others always maintains a sense of loose but professional behavior. So we're really getting a sense of where the strength of the show lies, not in its science fiction aspects, but rather in its execution and in its relationships, its humanity, and its way of instilling emotions in people. It shows that science fiction is as much a vehicle as any other medium for presenting human stories to people. It doesn't matter if it's set in the past, set in the present, or set in a fantastical future.